How did you convert to Islam? What's your story? You say your family is not close to Islam. How did your family react when you embraced Islam? Have you ever received a question that you couldn't answer? What now? What now? Seriously, what now? I didn't choose my name. I didn't choose my mom and dad. I didn't choose the way I look. There's a lot of things I didn't choose. I, would, I think I would have been in depression. Maybe I was being in a mental hospital. Has there been a stage when you were tired of making dawah and thought of stopping? You're welcome to Istanbul. Who is Ali Dawa? Who is Ali Dawa? Kurtlar Vadisi Pusu. Çok güzel oldu. Ona devam edin lütfen. Ben konuşurken background'a bunu koyabilir misiniz? Who is Ali Dawa? Is it your real name? No, Ali Dawa is not my real name. My real name is Erdi. Sona Erdi. The end. But a lot of people find it hard to pronounce. So I just said, it's easy, Ali. When I came to Islam, I had... Obviously, my family wasn't really, they didn't really like it, my dad specifically, so I was kicked out of my house. So I stayed in my friend's house. So I was with him and I said, look, I want to start, you know, doing dawah, etc. I said, what can I call myself? Ali on haq, Ali. And I thought, okay, Ali, Ali dawah. I said, I'm going to do dawah. I said, Ali dawah. People see you as someone who is very tough. Why are you so angry? Are you able to laugh? As you can see, I am. I actually laugh a lot of the times. I'm very jolly. I'm very like joking, you know, I like talking. So why do you seem so angry? You know what it is? It depends who I'm angry at. And I think which videos you watch. I think the algorithms is the problem, not me. Because I have a variety of videos, but I think the algorithms are picking the wrong ones mm -hmm. and suggesting the wrong ones. So like, for example, when we go to Speaker's Corner, Speaker's Corner has an atmosphere. The atmosphere is totally different. It's like being in, in, in some kind of intellectual battlefield. So you're there and there's, you know, different things happening. So what happens is sometimes you carry that with you because I do that every Sunday for the past nine years. Every, every Sunday? Sunday? Every Sunday, unless I'm traveling, I'm there. That's, that's routine for me because I call it the Dawah gym. It's where you train, where you, you know, talk. What happens is sometimes I carry that demeanor home with me. So when I go home and if me and my wife are getting in an argument and then I say, well, hold on a second, what's your premise and foundations for this argument? And she says, listen, you're not a speaker's corner today. Yeah, leave that back there. Because <laughs> it's like I'm talking to an atheist, like, what's your premise? What's your argument? Uh, there's a fallacy in your argument. She's thinking, what are you talking about? It's like, uh, come back to your senses. You want to go shopping. What is your argument? Exactly. What's your argument? It's, <laughs> so it's, it's, you carry that. So sometimes you just have to be like, hold on a second. Okay, I'm in the house now. Relax. So it happens, it happens, yeah. You're originally from Turkey, right? I am, yes, Kayseri. But you live in England? Yes. So I will ask you a question and yes. learn if you are integrated to English culture okay. or assimilated to English culture. Okay. Are you ready? Tea yes. or coffee? None. None. Okay, second question. Okay. On breakfast, cornflakes or pastırma? Come on, this is an insult to... I'm from Kayseri, uh, of course, Pastırma, and, so, and Sujuk. So you're not assimilated to English culture? No, 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 of course not. Okay, brother. Yes, I love my Pastırma. How did you convert to Islam? What's your story? My story is, when I was young, I used to live in London. I lived in London all my life. When I was around 15, 16, I was uh, involved with gangs. But I was very obsessed with guns. I think Kurtar Vadisi <laughs> was uh, one of them because I used to watch it, and I know how popular it was. So this one mentality of mafia, you know, and there was in London, we did have real mafia, like the Turkish, Kurdish, like they, they existed. Do you carry something with you right now? I mean, today I thought you might get scared, so I left it at home. Uh, <laughs> but I'll bring my AK-47 next time. Oh. <laughs> I'm joking. So the thing is, I was very like obsessed, etc. So I used to do silly things, you know. Then my dad took me outside London. When I went outside London, in London I used to be involved in gangs and fighting and stuff like that. But when I went there, the haram changed. So the haram lifestyle of gangs stopped then the haram lifestyle of clubbing and all these kind of stuff came into the picture. And I was looking in, like, I was just living my life, you know, materialism and, you know, just trying to have the best life, you know. And then there was one Bengali brother, Bangladeshi. He came to me and he wasn't practicing. He just said to me, you know, he was giving me dawah. You know, talk to me about Islam. Until that time, what were you believing? I, I didn't believe, I just believed in some power. There's some kind of a creator. Then afterwards, he showed me videos of uh, Dr. Zakir Naik, Ahmed Didat, Yusuf Estes. He was showing me these videos, and I can remember one day he took me to Tarawi. I didn't know what it was, he just said, yes, come. You know. It's a very hard start. Tarawi. It is, it was a very hard start. I, they, and they did 20, not eight. And then they get up again. I, I'm thinking, okay, maybe this is the last one. 
And then and again and again, I hated it. I was, I was, I was like, I'm never going again. So yeah, I did that. And then afterwards, he showed me these videos and I found it interesting because around those times, I was thinking to myself, I was starting to think, like, why am I here? What happens if I die? And I was very intrigued. I was like, you know, if I die, it'd be exciting. Like, what's after? What's, what happens after? I'm really in, intrigued. But I was starting to think. I was starting to think because I was realizing like, I'm not really happy. You know, you might have a lot of materialism and all these kinds of things. And I was thinking, you know, I was observing my socks. You know socks? I was thinking, I, was, I know it's strange, but I was looking at my socks. And I said, this socks has a purpose. This socks has a design. And this socks has a designer. That's somebody that made it. I said, how could this socks have a purpose and I don't have a purpose? Can you imagine my socks is for my feet? I started thinking, I was like, come on, like, there must be, you know, there must be something bigger than this. So that's when I realized that even though I believed in a higher intelligence, but I said, there has to be a religion that's the truth. Because you can't just believe there's God. And what did he make you for? Just for the sake of it? To play a game? So that's when I started looking into religion. And then I started reading the Bible. I started reading the Bible. I was looking into the Bible. Um, and I was watching these videos. I spent like three years looking into this stuff. I read the Quran. I started reading different, different, different scriptures. Um, and I was watching a lot of videos between Christians and Muslims and Hindus and discussions. I spent two, three years. When you researched other religions, yeah. what was the point that you believe these religions are not right? To be honest, I had one condition. The book that it claims is from God should not be contradiction. There should not be errors. It has to be preserved. It has to prove itself. That was the only one condition I had. So I used that condition to go through the Bible, the Old Testament, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, you name it. I had one rule and I said, if any book claims to be from God and is divine, it has to prove itself to me. The Quran, there's a specific verse in the Quran which hit me, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that if this was from other than your Lord, you would have found many contradictions and errors in it. That's number one. Number two, which was very profound to me, is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, bring a chapter like it, if you're truthful. That's a bold statement. It's like me coming and saying, I'm, I'm, I, I will knock out anybody. Show me anybody. This guy, right, boom. And, this guy, and then you prove yourself. The point is this, I'm stepping up to what I'm saying, you know? In the Quran, I was like, okay, hold on a second, let me put this to test. Because it's saying, bring a chapter like it. So when I researched and I realized that this verse was given to Arabs who were poets, who were par excellence in the Arabic language, and they couldn't bring a chapter like it. And some of them were amazed by it. So to me, it was like, wow. And then I looked for contradictions. I couldn't find no contradictions. And then there's miracles, prophecies. And I was like, man, you have to look in the mirror and lie to yourself to say this is not from God. And then I looked into the prophet, peace be upon him, his life and all this kind of stuff, they added up. So to me, you know, that was one of the reasons. And one other thing that was very profound. You see, sometimes a lot of people say, um, I'm not religious, I'm free. We're not free, nobody's free. We are all slaves to something. Be it your money, be it the opposite gender, be it the car, be it whatever you have in your, be your image, you are a slave to something. How? I didn't choose my name. I didn't choose my mom and dad. I didn't choose the way I look. There's a lot of things I didn't choose. How can I be free? Then I realized to myself that before Islam, I used to go clubbing, yeah? And when I used to go to this clubbing, I used to wear a jumper, a black jumper, yeah? And I believed I looked very handsome in this. But this jumper would make me feel very uncomfortable. I would itch, you know, this material. It's a very itchy material, but I would still wear it. Why? Because I look good in it. Now, the question I ask myself is this. This jumper is my master. Is my master because I wear it knowing I'm uncomfortable and I hate it, but I look good in it. I said, I'm the biggest slave because this is my master. This jumper is my master. Just as girls who wear high heels and their feet is bleeding, why do they wear it? Because I look good in it. That's your master. Money that I would work for, that was my second master. The opposite gender, girls, that was my third master. And I said to myself, these are all my masters and I'm a slave to all of them. I realized and said, I have to break the chains and free myself from them. And then I said, they are not deserving of my worship. Because when we're talking about worship, we're not talking about going into prostration. Because Allah says in the Quran, have you seen the one who takes his desires as his God? So when we talk about worship, people think, you know, when we say, oh, you worship money, they think we take money and we bow down to it. No, we don't. If that money is your life and everything, that's your ilah, that's your God. So I realized and said, I'm gonna break those shackles and be a slave, because we all have to be a slave, to the one who deserves it, Allah. When I started to be a master to the true creator, 
when I enslaved myself to Allah and break the shackles, that's when I became free. Because I didn't care about who thinks of what of me. When I used to go to university, I used to go to university so my family can say, oh, he's got a degree. Why do I care what they think? Why do I care about what this guy thinks or that person thinks? And I realized that we are all in a state. If you're either going to worship Allah or you're going to worship other things, there's always going to be some kind of a God in your life, which is false. Worship the true one. And when I came to Islam, it's like I freed myself from the whole world. And I said, look, now I'm totally free. I don't care what anyone calls me. When I came to Islam, people said, oh, this guy's ISIS. This guy, look at him. Um, they called me traitor. You know, but to me, it's like, I don't care what you think of me. I care about what the, the one who created me. I'm, I need to work to prove something to him because you guys are never going to be happy. And when I die, you're probably going to backbite me. So what benefit? So that's when I realized with a lot of factors, looking into the Islam, watching debates, people dying, realization of this dunya, etc. There was many elements that caused me to come to Islam. You say your family is not close to Islam. So how did your family react when you embraced Islam? There's been certain things that's happened in Turkey in the past that has caused the Alawi community to be attacked, killed. So they are very, very uh, strongly, strongly against it. And some people, like my mom was obviously accepting and she's always there to defend me, you know. Um, but my dad didn't like it. You know, my dad said the thing that I hate the most has been born into my family. Uh, so we make statements like that. Uh, I can remember once I was at my granddad's house and we were just talking, my dad came, and then this whole issue of Islam opened up, uh, up again. I was talking and it got very hostile. And I can remember going home. And when I went home, what's the problem? Like, like why are you so against me, etc. Then my dad slapped my face and he slapped me, bang, yeah? So uh, I left the house. I think it was from there I stayed at my friend's house for one month. The reason I came back was my mom said, if he goes, I'll leave as well. Um, so I think that was the reason I, I came back. My dad is not an evil person. I don't believe he's an evil person. There's things that he's lived and seen. Because when I tell my dad about miracles in the Quran, the prophecies, when I show these arguments, he says something to me. He says to me, you can show me all these evidences, but you will never make me forget how they made us feel. So now listen to this carefully. What he's telling me is an emotional argument. He's not telling me logical argument. He's saying this sounds very good to the ear. But he's saying you can never make me forget or how I felt when I saw them killing our people or burning them. Now that to me, how do I answer that? What do I say to that? There's nothing I can say to that, zero. The only way that I found out the best form of dawah that I can do to my parents was my manners, was my actions. That's it. Just let them see Islam in you. You know, because before how I used to be with my mom, how I am now, my mom knows that. My mom sees I've done a complete U-turn, like how I was with her before, how I am now. So I just try to portray Islam in the best way. Now my dad sometimes, like he'll watch, like he open TV and he sees like Bin Laden. And he says, come, come, your friend is here on TV. Yeah, and that's what he says to me. Yeah, so he says stuff like that, or oh, come, this is here. Or he calls me Mr. Haji, yeah. So the thing is, sometimes when he says, I just laugh off. Or sometimes I'll go, like if he's angry, I'll just go kiss him on the head. People who convert to Islam later in their life can sometimes have some hardships, especially about their old habits like dating, drinking alcohol. They can also have hard times about getting used to praying, fasting. What was your major challenge regarding these issues? It's a good question because when we speak to, when I do da'wah to people who are very close to accepting Islam, they are where I was. So it's the, you're in a dilemma between your sins and accepting Islam. Because you think to yourself, because shaitan comes and makes you feel as you're sinning. And he makes it seem that there's a condition that you have to not sin to become a Muslim, which is false. But the Prophet said, if mankind was not to sin, so if nobody sinned, Allah would destroy everybody and make a new creation that sins but repents. If you know Islam is the truth, you have to accept it. And then your journey starts. Of course, you will sin. The point is not living a life of sinlessness. Nobody's asking, Allah's not saying be angels, because then none of us would accept Islam. And we need to see it like this. It's the Quran and your salah is which is gonna stop you from sinning. We sometimes think it the other way around. I will stop sinning, then I would pray. I will stop sinning, then I'll read the Quran. No, the Quran and the salah will stop you sinning, not other way around. So this is a misconception that we have. Get closer to Allah and slowly, there's certain sins that took me four or five years to stop. The point is this, you try your best step at a time. What was the most difficult habit that you left? Drinking alcohol or no. dating? No, when it came, came to alcohol, I, I never smoked in my life. I never did drugs, never. I, I, was, 
I didn't like it. And I was not someone that was affected by peer pressure. Oh, my friends are doing it, let me do it. I was never like that. But I think it was dating. I think it was just the opposite gender, uh, which is one of the biggest obstacles. You know, when you come from that lifestyle, that was one of the hardest things. And I can remember uh, literally being scared and like feeling very, very guilty, like saying, oh Allah, please like protect me from this. Did you feel at any time that Allah made you experience something unique? I can remember once I was like, I think I came to Islam. I was very, very new. And I think I was speaking to someone, but I hated it. I one, one day I can remember I started crying. I just started crying and I said like, I hate this. Like, please, I can't help myself. Please help me. Wallahi, this is what I remember. I made that dua and it's as if somebody put me to sleep and I woke up in the dawah. That's how I feel. I feel like someone just said, okay, go sleep. When I woke up, all I remember is one, one year, one and a half year later, I'm doing dawah and then I remembered I remember this thing and I was like, I was going through the struggle, but it's as if like someone just put me to sleep and I don't know, I just woke up in the dawah. I don't know how if things happen fast, which reminds me what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, if you fear me, I will give you a way out from places you've never imagined. And I was like, wow, man, that was, that was amazed me. Like it was crazy where in my head, I was thinking like, oh, I'm gonna fall back into the sin and I hate it. And I was feeling rubbish about myself to just randomly things just happen, I go into the dawah, and things just happen so fast that I was so focused in dawah that I forgot about it. Like it just moved away and I found that very amazing. Where do you think you would be now if you had not accepted Islam? You know, that's a very good question. I was asking myself that question one month ago. So you know, I was thinking maybe I'll just be carrying on clubbing. And I was thinking what a disgusting life that would have been. Can you imagine how boring lifeless, purposeless, you do the same pattern again and again and again. And what this leads to is you wanting to explore other things. The thing is, you don't stop. And I was thinking I would be in a terrible place. I think I would be depressed, unhappy, no purpose. But genuinely, I was getting depressed thinking about it. I was thinking, oh my gosh, man, where the hell would I, would have I been? And it makes me depressed thinking about it. Because you, when you don't know your purpose, and when you have had the dunya, you come to a point where you're blank. You've had everything, what now? What now, seriously, what now? This is where suicide, mental depression, I, would, I think I would have been in depression. Maybe I was being in a mental hospital. How and why did you decide to start a YouTube channel? I didn't want to start a YouTube channel. I went to Speaker's Corner just doing dawah and there was one friend I used to work with and he said to me, start a channel. I said, nah, I said, I'm camera shy. I don't like this kind of stuff. I said, I'm happy, I just come do my dawah. He said, no, no, start it, start it. He was keep telling me, no, it's good, you do it, da, da, da. My first two videos on my channel, if you go back, it's, it was recorded on a phone, uh, like very unprofessionally. Yeah, I just done it and then uh, like people benefited and I thought, okay, all right. And then I fundraised for a camera. And it was just that I didn't intend to. Can you explain one incident which impacted you most during interviews? Where something very interesting happened. There's a brother called John Fontaine. He's a Muslim, alhamdulillah. I'm quite new. What happened was, I was with him in a friend's house. We was gonna leave to go to a specific place to do dawah. So me and him leave, we're on the train, we're sitting like this. He said, let's make dua, and then he started carrying on. So I'm listening, I'm saying, ameen. Oh Allah, bless our dawah. Allow somebody to come to Islam by 3 p.m. And in my head, I'm thinking, oh, this guy's very specific. Like, I said, okay, I mean, and then I forgot about it. I said, yeah, okay, whatever. So we go, we're doing dawah, I'm doing dawah here, etc. I was giving leaflets out, two people came, one lady and one guy. They had bags, they were doing shopping. Usually people who have bags, they don't stop. It's cold, they've got bags. Last thing you wanna do is talk about religion. They came like it's an appointment. They came right in front of me and stopped, put their bags and asked a question. And they seemed very keen, Pakistan, yeah, we believe this, we believe that. And I thought, oh, wow, interesting. And then they took the shahada. I didn't think nothing of it. And then I said, tell John Fontaine to come, you know, like, you know, take a picture together, etc." I said, I took shahada. And, and John was like, Ali, Ali. I said, what's this? I said, what's going on? I said, you've got gin inside you. Why are you shouting? Ali. I said, what, what? He goes, what's the time? What's the time? I felt like, what's this guy talking about? I said, brother, they took shahada. What are you talking about time? It's not, it's not the time to ask what the time. Let's talk to them. He's like, no, no, what's the time? I said, bro, I don't know. I said, maybe like it was 2.48. He said, remember, remember. I said, remember what? And then when it hit me, and I was like, oh, wallahi. When that happened, I had to sit down. Like it hit me. Like, I sat, I had to sit down for a second, like literally. And it's as if Allah was telling me, don't belittle dua. And don't see dua as, yeah, yeah. And that is when I was like, wow, I was blown away, man. I was like, oh my gosh. And we did a video about this. It's on my channel, yeah. We did a video about it with him and we talk about the story. 
Uh, and that, that was crazy to me. And that taught me a massive lesson. It taught me because as human beings, we do everything. We would, for example, you want to get married, you do everything. You go uh, marriage side, this place, that side, here, there, left, right, center, get into haram. Da, da. But we, and then when nothing works, then we do dua. We do all the things and like, okay, what should we do now? Okay, all right, let's do dua now. Dua should be number one, first. So that taught me a lesson that how powerful dua is. And I think the Prophet said that. He said that one of the powerful things for believer is his dua. So um, yeah, that was very, very profound to me. Have you ever received a question that you couldn't answer? Or if you did, uh, what would you do? Yes, I get that a lot. I get questions relating to other stuff which I can't answer. But Allah says in the Quran, if you don't know, ask somebody that knows. So I will ask my seniors and I will say, look, let me get Brother Mansur or Hijab or Hamza Zorzis or whoever's in the park. Can you answer that? It's simple. I think saying I don't know is a part of the religion. You know, you can't say everything I know, I know. It's actually very bad, you know, if you even think. You are in the elevator yes. and you notice that a young man who doesn't pray, you want him to start praying Salah. Yeah. You only have one time. What would you like to say to him? I would personally say to him that, look, if I was a millionaire, and I gave you a mansion, I gave you the cars. Every week I provided you 10,000 pounds for you to spend, yeah? Would you thank me? Yeah, of course. When I'm next to you, how would you be? The way you treat me, you'll be careful, etc. how you talk, your tone, yes sir, etc. Why would you do this? Because you gave me gifts. I'll give you things and you are thankful for that, yeah? And I would say the same thing applies to Allah because Allah has given you more and he promises you more. So if you are going to be thankful to me for giving you a house, for giving you all these things, and if I said to you, can you call me five times a day? Would you call me five times a day or 20 times a day? Of course. You call me as much as you can. Allah doesn't want that. The point is that the things that you're grateful for, if we turn it into who Allah is and what he gives us, he only asks five times a day. He can ask you 24 hours a day because he deserves it. He doesn't even want 24 hours. He says, pray five times a day. That's what I would say personally. Has there been a stage when you were tired of making dawah and thought of stopping? Yes. Uh, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, I was going through a lot of struggles. And even like with my intentions, I was really questioning my intentions. I was asking, why am I doing this? Are you doing this for Allah? Oh no, you're not. What about here? I came to a point where I couldn't figure out. I said, I don't know. I don't know. Even if you ask me the question, are you doing this dawah for Allah? I'll say, Inshallah, I don't know. Because your intention is such a big, big area where certain scholars, they said, the biggest struggles we had is with our intentions. One day is for me, one day is against me. So my intentions was a point where I said, I'm gonna leave the dawah. Because I can't carry on, because we know one of the first free people to enter the hellfire. Do you know this hadith? The first free people to enter the hellfire is uh, Muslim. Yeah. Quran, the one who gave in charity, the one who fought in jihad. Allah asked them, what did you do? He says, I, I teach Quran. He said, no, you didn't. You did it so people say you're a very knowledgeable man. He said, take him to the hellfire. The second one, he said, what did you do for my sake? He said, oh Allah, I gave him zakah, sadaqah. He said, you're a liar. You didn't do it for me. This man is a very generous man. He helps everybody. Hellfire. The third one is someone who fought in jihad. And Allah said, what did you do? He said, I fought in your sake. He said, you're a liar. You did it so people say, I'm a brave man. All three of them go to the hellfire. This to me is very scary. So imagine standing in front of Allah and Allah says, what did you do? I did that. He said, you're a liar. You did it for the fame. You did it for this, this. So that was very scary to me. Have you stopped in that period? I was contemplating. I spoke to my teachers and they said, don't, it's from shaitan. But he said, you cannot stop something for the sake of Allah, other than for his sake. I just had to, I had, I came to a conclusion which helped me, which is the following. I said that if I stand in front of Allah, if Allah says, what did you do for me? I will not mention my dawah. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say, oh Allah, you know my private sin deeds that I've been doing? That's what I did because it's between me and you. No one's there when I did it. That is what I'm coming to you with. If Allah mentions my dawah, good. No, I don't care. I'm not relying on that. And this has pushed me to do more private deeds. So it's good. So now I know I rely on this. Dawah, if accepted, no problem. No accepted, I don't care. That's what helped me to carry on. You work as an Uber driver. Could you tell us about an interesting incident you had? I stopped doing Uber recently my license ran out. I wanted to renew it, but I couldn't. And I thought maybe it's Qadr of Allah. But there was one interesting, I can remember it was nighttime. I think it was the last job that I was gonna have. I was gonna go home. So I go and it's this lady and I was looking for her. I was parked. I said, yeah, I'm here. Like, where are you? And she's like, oh, um, I'm stuck. 
I said, stuck where? I don't know what she's talking about. She goes, I'm stuck. There's these gates, etc. And I said, I don't know, where are you? And I was going. And I saw her and there was these gates. And she was stuck. And she's like a young girl. She said, can you help me? I said, I, I don't think I can help you because <laughs> I need to help myself first. <laughs> so she said, oh, I need to get out. I'm stuck. Yeah, I said, look for buttons. There might be buttons. They said, no, no, there, there. I said, and she pressed it. The gate's open. I said, alhamdulillah. Because <laughs> I'm definitely not helping you. Not that I don't want to help her, but obviously, yeah, because we can't touch the opposite gender. So anyway, she came. She got into the car and then we was driving. I was dropping off she, very far. She was going somewhere very far. I just started talking about Islam to her. I thought, let me speak. Because I was, speaking, I was feeling very sleepy as well. I said, I need to talk about something. Otherwise, I'm going to fall asleep. Anyways, so I started talking. And she knew. She knew a lot about Islam. She was talking, yeah, I have Arab friends, etc. I was like, good, good. I was talking, 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 and she she took a shahada in the car. I was surprised. I was very like, like because I was I I didn't intend. I was just talking about Islam. And this time she goes, yeah, I believe in Allah. Okay, okay, good. I believe in the Prophet. And I said, okay. So I said, you're a Muslim. You're a Muslim, isn't it? It's like I told her. I, I give this example. See, people who believe in Allah and the Prophet, but they're like, oh, I don't know if I should take my shahada. I, it's, it's very simple. I tell them, what's your favorite food? And they'll say, okay, for example, I don't know, uh, chicken dinner, like we're talking about today. So I say to them, it's very simple. Do you like chicken dinner? Yes. I've got to repeat after me. I love chicken dinner. This is, shahada is the same thing. In the context, you believe and know inside your heart that you love chicken dinner. All you have to do is repeat it. So the shahada in your heart, you believe in Allah, you believe in the Prophet. Just repeat what you already believe in your heart. It's as simple as that. I, I like chocolate inside my heart. I just have to confess it. That's what the shahada is. So people think it's like something big, like a white light is going to come and they're going to start flying. So yeah, it's, and I saw that in her and she took a shahada, yeah. And then I got in contact with some sisters. And yeah, that's the last time. That was very interesting, like, and it woke me up as well because I was like, wow, like, you know, I was falling asleep. Once upon a time, you announced that you would release your marriage documentary, <laughs> but you couldn't. Which one is more difficult, to get married or make a documentary about getting married? That's, I think that's the best question I've heard in a very long time. I get a lot of people in my comment, every video. When is the marriage documentary coming out? When is it coming out? When is it coming out? It's only six years late. The reason being is because there's a lot of life lessons I learned. And that in the documentary, I share my experience as a Muslim man who's keeping things halal, the difficulties I, I went through. And I'm documenting this. I believe when it comes to marriage, something a person can go through, I went through all of it. And it's as if Allah took me through all the scenarios, everything. Not finding the right one, finding the right one, the family saying no, oh, you're not from our culture, you're not from this, rejected. Uh, as a man, you know, you're faced with fitna. How do you deal with that? Everything, I went through it. And you need to bear in mind, these are Muslims. These are Muslims saying no to a Muslim. So there's, there's no issue of, okay, does he pray? No, that's not the issue. What's the issue? He's not from our culture. And I face this a lot. And there's a hadith of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, if a righteous man, and I'm not saying I'm righteous, I'm saying somebody who prays does the basic, comes to ask for your daughter's hand. If you say no, there'll be fitna in the land. And this is exactly what we see. You've made the halal haram, and you've made the haram halal. And that's the reason why our youngsters are committing zina. You've made something which is so easy, and nikah takes 15 minutes max to do, and you're married. You make that process so long and so difficult, and these things destroy you. Like Allah says in the Quran, don't even come near zina. Allah doesn't say that about alcohol, doesn't say about gambling, doesn't say about murder. For zina, Allah says, don't even go near it. Zina's here, I'll go like this. Allah says, go around the block. Like, go all the way somewhere else. Why? Because this thing here destroys. Like I said about my cousin who killed himself, it was over a girl. This issue of marriage is an issue of tawheed. I'm trying to reconnect them back to Allah, having trust in Allah. Even our sisters taking the hijab off or beautifying themselves. The issue here is tawakkul. What you're saying is very simple. And shaitan tried to tempt me as well. Where you think that the matter is in your hands. So when a sister shows her hair or starts to dress up tight, the problem here is tawheed because what she's saying is the following. She's saying basically, I don't think Allah can find me someone. Therefore, I'm going to take the matters in my hand. I'm going to show my body and I'm going to dress up a certain way so I can find someone. Can you imagine this? Just think about it, yeah? And the same goes with brothers. The brothers, like, for example, they sell drugs. Because I'm going to get married, brother, I have to provide. My boy. You don't trust the one who created the heavens and the earth, the universe. Have you seen the video where it shows our planet and it shows the star and the moon and, and this? Have you seen that? Can you imagine Allah who created all of that? Can't find you a wife, can't find you a husband. It's crazy. The point is this, we take matters in our own hands because we think, okay, I've tried, it's not working, I know. If I beautify myself, 
take some pictures, look this way, sell drugs, then I can get... This is an issue of tawakkul. Allah will test you. You're going to be tested. And Allah can give you a wife. Uqsum billah. He can give you a wife. He can give you the best husband. You know, I went through a lot of struggles. Lot. Allah tested me. Literally, push, you know the cliff? I was on the verge of cliff like this. <laughs> it's good. If you put your trust in Allah, when you drop in that cliff, you'll have a nice parachute. And you have a nice landing and your wife and husband will be waiting at the bottom. The point is this, is that you will be tested and Allah will put you through these tests. If you stay firm, your dua will be answered. Trust me. What dreams do you have? And what is the biggest goal you want to achieve? Recently, I would say the marriage documentary is one of the things that I've been... It's a project of, a, it's, it's, I see it as a sadaqah jariya. It's such a big problem. Haram relationships and even marrying the wrong person can be devastating. You marry the wrong person, they can literally, it can be the end of you. So it's very important for us to be very careful who they pick to get married. My aim with this is not to get people married. I want people to stay married. Is it hard to be a Muslim in England? Did you ever regret living in UK? No, I think England is, is a very good place. I even believe it's better in some Muslim countries. I can practice freely, I can preach freely. If you want to pray, is it yeah. easy for you to yeah. find a masjid? Yes, it is. For example, if I'm shopping, if I'm going on Oxford Street and I see a shop, clothing shop, I'll go there and try a t-shirt and pray masala in the changing room. It's, it's very simple, it's a changing room. I try the clothes on, I hit two birds with one stone. What if someone comes and knocks Hey, sir, are you there? I'll say, Allahu Akbar. And he might get scared and uh, uh, go. <laughs> I don't think anyone would come. How do you see the future of Islam in the United Kingdom? They say that Christianity is no longer the main religion followed in England. And the majority of England is atheists. Atheism destroyed the religion of Christianity in the West. And now they are open to Islam. I believe it's good. If it carries on like this, it's good. And if they allow us, if they believe in a democratic system, and their freedom of speech, I believe one day Britain, with free will, people will come to Islam. I think it might be a Islamic country. I believe only if they go against their own principles is when they will stop Islam. We don't need violence, we don't need none of this. Let us do dawah, and then you will see people in the thousands come into Islam, and then we're gonna see, are you gonna take violent, kick us out? We don't know what you're gonna do. Our job is you let us do our dawah, and we'll see. I believe the, the whole country will come to Islam. Because what they didn't realize, atheists, is that people are spiritual. And now they're becoming spiritually hungry. They're starving. Mm. We eat food and drink water because we want to keep our body intact. We sleep. The soul is the same thing. The soul has soul food. Once that is taken away, what they realize is a pandemic in the West of people spiritually starving. They're dying spiritually. And because of that, they realize that Islam is a brilliant solution to this. So people are coming to Islam and now they're like, we made a big mistake because we got rid of Christianity, but now it's being replaced by Islam. So now they're like, okay, what do we do now? So that's why you have people like who are now new atheists who are going into spirituality, atheist spirituality, yeah? Because they realize that it's not materialistic world only. People have, you know, deeper uh, spiritual connections. So that's where they're going, but they have done a job for us that now we are, you know, people are coming to Islam left, right, center. You know, many people, I don't remember in the park, one person coming to Christianity. Instead of doing dawah, you could have prayed by yourself, read Quran, carry on living as a regular Muslim. Why did you choose to follow this path? Why are you going every Sunday to give dawah? To do no. <laughs> so sorry, you know, you know when you say this, it's like my mom is talking to me, because she says exactly what you're saying. She says <laughs> really? exactly what you're saying. She says to me, you could have prayed, you could have just do your stuff at home. Why do you go to the park every day? That's, what you're saying is what my mom says to me every time. Look, when I do dawah, people think I do dawah for um, others. Look, yes, I like to spread the message of Islam. Yes, it's the kalam of Allah. I would want the whole world to know that. But beside that, I do dawah because I do dawah to myself. So being involved in dawah keeps me away from sins. So when I'm doing dawah, I'm actually doing dawah to myself. Because if I wasn't in dawah, I might be doing something wrong. When I'm in the dawah, the people that have to be around me have to be in dawah. The books I have to study have to be relating to dawah. The videos that I watch have to be relating to dawah. Everything has to follow. Not only that, if I'm portraying myself a certain way, I have to live up to that. I can't live a double life. I can't say, okay, yeah, night times I'm in the clubs, and daytime I do dawah. If I wasn't true to that, I wouldn't find that hard. So alhamdulillah, I'm true to it and I believe in it and it keeps me away from sins. Is there anything that you want to add? No. <laughs> Ali Dawa is a smiling guy, he's a smart guy.
He's not tough. Yes, I'm, I'm soft. Soft criminal. Mashallah, <laughs> <laughs>